Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is the Gospel reading according to St. Matthew, chapter 28, printed for you on page 7 of your folder. Would you please join me in prayer? Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our text is the ending of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. This takes place at the time of the ascension, but it's worth noting that Matthew doesn't talk about the ascension. Instead, Matthew tells us what Jesus said and what he gave to his church. He commissioned his church to go and disciple all nations. As we look at our text, we rejoice that God has given us a definition of what the church is to be about. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we were speaking out of Peter, and we were talking about being living stones, supporting and encouraging one another, lifting one another up, rising up to give praise to God. Today, we hear a little bit more about what it means to take that work of God, that work of salvation, out into the world and to distribute it. God has given the church her marching orders, if you will, in this text. And we're going to look at this a little bit more homiletically, a little bit more teaching rather than sermonizing. And I know some of you are used to that, some of you appreciate it, and some of you don't. (laughs) But some of you may want to pick up your pencil because we're going to walk right through the text, all right? Now, the 11 disciples, why 11? Judas had already committed suicide. Judas was already not a part of their number. And the 11 disciples went to Galilee. That's the home area of Jesus, you know, up north. Not down in Jerusalem, but up north a place that many people considered to be the backwaters. That's where all the hicks were from. That was where the the people who were not as cultured were from. Galilee of the Gentiles, it was referred to as. The 11 disciples went to Galilee. They went home to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Now, evidently, at some time during his time with his disciples, he had told them the very mountain that he would meet them at. And you may remember that at the time of the resurrection, the angels said, go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Another fulfillment of another promise. And Jesus directing his disciples where they need to be. Get out of the home city of Jerusalem here. Move. Get out. Go to where you are at home. I have a gift to give to you. They saw him and they worshiped him. Indeed, how could you do any other? Jesus is there. They come to the mountain and they see Jesus and they're in awe. Some doubted, but the general population was pleased and they were blessed and they adored him. Some think that this is that time when Jesus appeared to more than 500 of the brethren, as Paul talks about in the epistles. It could be then that there was a whole group of disciples there on this mountain, not just the 11 apostles. As Jesus spoke these words about what the church is to be about, what the church's business is, they went to the mountain where he told them to go, they saw him, and Jesus came to them. Notice how that all works. It's really very sacramental, if you will. God tells us where to go. No, why did they have to go to that particular mountain? Why couldn't they go to that mountain? Wouldn't that mountain make more sense? No, he said go to this mountain. That's the way it is with the sacraments and the means of grace as well. He says go to the word. He says, go to the water and the word. Go to the bread and wine and the word. 
there you will see me. And I will come to you, and I will bless you. You see, we just do what those early disciples did, of following his directions, going where he tells us to go, and he fulfills the promise to once again come and bless us. That's what he loves to do. For those who think that God is far off in his heaven, they couldn't be any farther from the truth. God loves to be in the midst of things. He loves his creation. He wants to be in the middle of it. And even when our sin brings darkness all around, that is where he loves to be so that he can work his redeeming work so that he can set his people free, so he can take away our fears and anxieties, so that he can assure us of his love for us as individuals, for you as an individual person whose name he knows. He knows your heart. He knows everything about you. And he loves to come to you to bless you. And sometimes that blessing will come through words of law. Sometimes he will have to rebuke you or admonish you in order to keep you safe and to keep you on the right path. And other times they will just be words of overwhelming gospel. But you see, it is the goodness of God that brings him to you. His love for you that speaks from his heart in law and gospel that you might be filled with life that you may walk with him each day. Jesus came and said to them, all authority, not just some authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now let's not think that as the son of God, he didn't already have authority over creation. We see that as he does the miracles. We think especially of the storm on the sea. Only the one who made the sea could tell the sea and the wind to be still, and they would have to obey. As the Son of God, he had all authority. But remember, he also is our human brother, the Son of Man, for the specific purpose of sharing our woe and taking our burden, dying for our sin so that he might give us his life. And so, having been crucified and now risen, having shown himself to his disciples alive, he assures them, all authority has been given to me. The Lord has authority even over the darkness. And there may be times when we doubt or question that. There may be times when we wonder why in the world God isn't acting or why he's not paying attention. Let me assure you, he is paying attention. And he knows what's going on. But he has a greater purpose than what you and I can necessarily see in the here and now. As we look through scripture, we know that the darkness can only go as far as God will allow it to go. He's put a leash on it. He's set boundaries. And even if that captivity, like with Israel, lasts for 70 years, there is a limit. God sets limits for the darkness. And he attaches himself to things. And all so that you and I might enjoy his personal blessing. All authority has been given to me, he says. And in his speaking, then he gives it to us. He says, therefore, go. Now, the word go there is not a command word. It's rather a word that describes our life. Having gone in your going as you go, disciple all nations. Some of you have probably heard it to the point where you're tired of hearing it, but I won't stop saying it anyway because a reminder is always good. Disciple is a verb in the Greek. It is not a noun. God never calls you to make a disciple. You and I can't make disciples. Only God can do that. And so he says, in your going about life, in your going, disciple all nations. How? By baptizing In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You see, God is the one who is at work in all of that. 
God is the one who takes hold of us and writes our name in the book of heaven. God is the one who gives to us the gift of life. It's not by some decision or choice that we make. It's God at work. It's not about how good we are as people, but how good he is as God. And that great mercy that God has shown to us, how can that do anything but change the hearts of those who truly receive and believe the gift that that is? But be not surprised when some still doubt. That's the way it is. All of us on one occasion or another have perhaps questioned or wondered. And the Lord is very good about that, just as he was with Thomas. He doesn't chastise us for being sinful human beings. He hates the sin. He loves the sinner. Yes, he loves you enough to recognize that you are fragile and weak. And his love for you will not allow that to come between you and him. Disciple all nations. How? Baptizing and teaching. That's what we celebrate with every confirmation. That those babies who were baptized and God planted the seed of faith in their heart, that they've grown up and they've learned that you, the church, have taught them what that means. The faith that was put into their hearts, you've helped them to learn what that means. And you've surrounded them with the word of God so that they can grow in that life and they get to that point where now they're ready to publicly confess it for themselves, to acknowledge Jesus before men, even as he acknowledges you before the Father. That is what we celebrate at confirmation, that baptizing and teaching have been done. And while he gives us no order that they have to be in, it is interesting here that he puts them in the order that he does of baptizing and teaching. Remember, most of the people who were coming into the early church were adults. So they were being taught first and then baptized when they confessed the faith. Unfortunately, many in the Protestant world translate disciple as teach. And so you're teaching and you're baptizing and then you're teaching. And the emphasis on baptism is completely lost. No, no. It is through baptizing and teaching that he makes disciples. Some come to faith and then are baptized. Some are brought to faith in their baptism, like I was as an infant. But God the Holy Spirit is at work bringing that word of God to live within the heart and the mind of that person. And it's not about our smarts, but about his love. We can never make our faith about how much we understand or how much or how hard we believe because that always means it depends on us. And if it depends on us, it's going to be faulty and we're not going to be saved. But God comes with that gift and gives it to us, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. I hate that they translate that word as commanded you. <laughs> It's more like everything that he commended to you. It's a pantahaza, teaching them all things whatsoever I have commended to you. What does that mean? It means treasuring, holding dear everything that he has spoken to us, not just his commandments, but the gospel, the creation, the joy that will be ours in heaven, all of those things, his love for you and for me. His desire for us to share that love with others in words and deeds. Teaching them to treasure and to cherish everything I have spoken to you. And he never asks us to do anything without also giving us a blessing. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. There is a truth that we can grab hold of every single moment. The whole purpose for Jesus becoming man, going to the cross and rising from death was so that he could bring God and man back together. You, child of God, have God walking with you every single day, every moment of the day. When the good things happen and when the bad things happen. 
He's not ignorant of your suffering. He knows it thoroughly. And he cares about it. That's why he sets limits for the darkness. So that it will not consume us. And so that we will know that his love is the only thing that is boundless. Jesus gives us our marching orders in this text. And in doing so, he reminds us of God's great love and the comfort that belongs to us as the children of God. And he sends us out just to live our life in that freedom that lack of fear and anxiety, because we know that sin, death, and the devil, they don't get the last word. Not even death gets the last word. No, God has the last word. And the God who loves you has said, it is finished. The God who loves you says, I have prepared a place for you, and I will come to take you that you may be where I am. In our going about in that freedom from anxiety and fear, in our living out of our daily life, in our freedom to try and fail, to make mistakes and to be forgiven, and to continue to learn the right paths down which God would lead us. In all of that living, with our words and our deeds, to share this message with others. It has been said, you might be the only Bible that some people have ever seen. While I wouldn't take that too far, there is a certain truth in that. God has given us as a light to the world to shine the light of Christ into the darkness so that when people look at us, they don't see perfect people, although sometimes maybe we act like we think we are, but people who are forgiven, people who are not perfect, and yet loved so deeply by God. People who make mistakes and yet are not afraid to face the future and have that security of being able to come to the very throne of God and casting all our cares upon him. You, child of God, have been called by Jesus and empowered by his spirit to proclaim the goodness and love of God his mercy in words and deeds that all the world may come to know him. And his purpose for ancient Israel is fulfilled in the new Israel when his word is alive in us and goes out into all the world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.